Hey folks, Andrew. Can't hear you. Uh, give me one sec here. Can you guys hear me okay? Let me know if uh, if my audio is okay, and I'll. Uh, can't hear you, uh, Andrew. Um, still no audio. Give me one sec. Let me see if that's any better. Okay, no, no uh, audio on your end um, just yet. Bear with me. I'm gonna uh, have you rejoin if you can. What are you connected in the um, uh, through your computer itself or through? Uh... Okay, sorry, I, I can't hear you at all, uh, Andrew. Can you try rejoining? And I'm just going to allow you to come back in there. Okay. Hey, guys. So welcome. Uh, we're doing Prince for Wildlife Photographer Spotlight. We have Andrew uh, joining us, Andrew uh, Avely. He's just going to reconnect the audio. So if you guys come into the chat here, let us know where you guys are calling in from. So my I'm calling in from Vancouver Island, Canada, and uh, I am on the Prince for Wildlife team. So I've been with uh, as a contributing photographer as well as a uh, the digital marketer for Prince for Wildlife. So thank you guys so much for uh, joining us today. We're going to have Andrew um, join us in just a second. His audio is a little bit out. Okay, Elizabeth is from Ottawa. Welcome. Nick is from White River, South Africa. Sounds amazing. Anybody else? So feel free to use that chat. Um, you guys can use the three little buttons to convert it into a question. So we can ask um, Andrew uh, some specific questions about his photography. Yeah, okay, still, let me just see here. One second. I don't have any audio from you at all. Um, can you guys can you guys hear Andrew okay, or is it just me? Andrew, do you, would you mind just saying a few words? Yeah, still, still nothing on my end. If you guys can let me know if you can hear Andrew. No, still nothing. Okay, just give me one sec here. Let's try to troubleshoot this. So, Andrew, I'm not sure if you have this uh, section on your thing, but there's a settings uh, cog on the left. And there you can configure your video and audio settings. Uh, still nothing now. Now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, beautiful. Hey, hey awesome. <laughs> right on. Thanks so much for joining, Andrew. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. And um, yeah, I mean, beyond the technical stuff, we're here. We're happy. We're smiling. You have quite the little setup there. Where are you calling in from today? Uh, I'm in a little town in South Africa called White River. It's about uh, 40 kilometers from the Kruger National Park. It's in the low felt. Uh, everybody would know the Sabi Sands, the Timbavati, the Kruger, that area. Uh, sort of where I work from uh, currently and uh, live in a very small town. Amazing. Amazing. So obviously you're, uh, you're right in the mix of, of uh, all this stuff. So what's, what's your history with Prince for Wildlife and, and how did you get involved? Um, yeah, I've been a professional wildlife photographer for about 18 years. And, um, you know, in seeing things as they went along, I've known a few people that work at African Parks. And uh, the suggestion came up for me to get hold of uh, the guys behind the scene. And, uh, yeah, they chose some of my work. And, uh, yeah, I'm really honored to be given that opportunity. It's always nice to not only give back, um, you know, in other ways, but to have people recognize you or feel that your work is worthy for the conservation cause. So that that to me was very important. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to contribute as long as my work is uh, good enough for them. So yeah, um, I'm very happy with that. Well, your work is incredible. I, I've been checking you out, um, obviously behind the scenes here. And and uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for, for your commitment for conservation. Um, it's for, for me myself, you know, this is, I'm coming from Canada. So to see all the support for Africa, uh, worldwide is, is absolutely, uh, it's incredible. Obviously it's, it's been like almost like a viral, uh, campaign, right? Initially it started with COVID impacting tourism. 
Um, now it's 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 about African parks kind of expanding and making sure that they can secure these areas. Um, what from your experience and your background, obviously you've been doing safari probably since since you were born, I imagine. And and how has that evolved? How has your career evolved? Like what where did you start? Where are you at now? Well, I've actually got a funny story. Up until you know, even living in South Africa, I was based at the coast for most of my life. Uh, and until I met my wife, I'd never been to the bush. Um, so, you know, I'd lived by the coast in a very small town and there was nothing much else to do but go fishing, go to the beach and just hang out. And then uh, in, two, in 2000, uh, I went to a very small game reserve north of Johannesburg and Pretoria in South Africa. It's called the Pilansburg. Um, it's a very small uh, reserve. And I had the most incredible experience there. And I'd always dabbled in photography, mostly film photography, but sort of happy snap. And, um, yeah, look, that was the end. I can tell you the story, but uh, I spent 10 times more time in the bush than she does, and she introduced me to the bush. So <laughs> I, I combined my passion for um, photography. Um, and I only sort of recently moved up here due to COVID. I also had to relocate. Uh, so it's very beneficial to be this close, um, but I always used to have to travel, so I couldn't be uh, in in the bush or in the game reserves every week as I can. Uh, luckily now for me, work-wise, I can. Um, and I only used to photograph a lot of um, different things, local nature, birds, uh, and I concentrated on the commercial side with uh, international motorsport, world superbikes, A1 Grand Prix, uh, the South African cricket and rugby, cycling, uh, sort of to stay busy with action and uh, also have an extensive extensive commercial background. Um, so, yeah, but, uh, you know, for me, conservation for the last 10 years or so, uh, 12 years has been very important. Uh, I work on the ground with a few organizations, um, sort of in the background, and then also through my photography, uh, try and contribute where I can. Amazing. So that initial uh, bit of, of conservation work, like as you got into you know photography and staying in the bush <laughs> as long as you have now, was was there something that you experienced personally that that kind of said, yeah, I'm into conservation? Because there's a big difference between you know wildlife photographers. Some are there just to capture those beautiful images, and and you know that that kind of is their own thing. But others, you know, it's it's this conservation piece. It's like creating a giving a voice to the to the voiceless, so to speak. Was there a moment in time or something you experienced or heard about that kind of tipped you into that direction? Yeah, look, I've always been sort of when I got to know the bush and in the maritime industry, I've always been very conservation conservation aware. Um, you know, it's, it's not as easy uh, with the oceans to protect them, but, you know, we'd always get involved in sort of the, the eco side of it, cleaning up making sure, you know, plastics, that type of thing. But for me, the wildlife was always, it seemed a little bit out of out of reach. And then uh, I actually went on a, um, I was invited to join a few businessmen who every year did a conservation project. And um, uh, that changed me completely. I was fortunate to um, be involved with the dehorning of, of four rhinos um, in a process to microchip and to do all of that. And I think Man. the first time, you know, that's going on 11, 12 years ago, when I was actually able to touch, physically stand, hear, smell, um, you know, it, it was an absolutely emotional mo moment for me. And, you know, being able to touch the rhino and actually of what they've been going through, it, even at that time, 10 years ago. And, I mean, I, I, I like to tell the story. I just sort of on the side rested on the had a nice little cry, got up, finished what I had to do. And then, you know, it just it was so emotional, intense. And then I realized, you know, through photography and not only that, but using photographers, exposing them to other avenues of just what you would see on social media as in um, the great reserves in Central Africa. And, you know, for me, Africa is my focus. Uh, I would yeah. love to you know, come to Canada to see a few different places there come to the United States. Also, landscape photography is something I'm very passionate about. Um, but, you know, in this type of industry, you sort of only show one side of you to make sure that that's what you <laughs> do the most. So, um, right. for me, it's it's just being able to help people connect and see a much wider uh, sort of thing, wider feeling, or wider vision that's available for them. Um, and sort of that's 
that's my goal at the moment. Amazing. So how does that link in with your, your current career path right now? What, what is, how does wildlife photography play a part of that? So obviously you're doing some commercial work, which is great because for people who, you know, are looking to invest big in the lenses, I say, you know, figure out how you can get someone else to pay for it. And that's usually through commercial sports deals, right? Like the telephoto lenses, who, who, what other uh, avenues, you know, can you use to bring into the wildlife? Cause the wildlife, those aren't the people with the, the things with the deep pocket. So how does your, how do you make this work as being like a wildlife photographer? Um, it's not very easy, you know, especially in the last three years, but um, you know, I've got um, a, a wealth of business experience. Um, I've had a number of companies, but, uh, also, about eight years ago, sold them all up. I didn't plan for my retirement. I just wanted to get out there and, and work with nature full time. So it's it's not an easy uh, career path. Um, I do a lot. I love teaching and training. So I do um, some specialized training with photography, whether it be technical, whether it be in different camera brands, um, whether it be um, in printing, for example. I do online training for print. And then also I'm a, um, in South Africa, we have a very restrictive um, drone UAV industry, yeah. um, which is highly regulated. So I'm actually an instructor and I teach commercial or anybody who wants to become a commercial drone pilot, I do that teaching. And then I bring my photography into that and, and, and sort of the value add for me is I teach people more about the technical side of photography and video with a drone. And I'm sort of moving into the conservation where you don't get too close to the animals. You need to read animal behavior and, you know, fly the drone. So that's sort of a sideline project, which sort of helps Amazing. me tick over. But, um, yeah, yeah um, that, that sort of, it's all a bit of a uh, up and down at the moment, still trying to figure out as the world settles after COVID and travel becomes sort of really open again. Um, yeah. But that sort of is my main goal is to, is do a different kind of experience, not, not not necessarily a safari, but more nature or a wilderness experience with people and using photography as the as the vehicle for that. Beautiful. So if someone were, you know, to, to inquire about coming on a trip with you, you would have that, you know, availability to do that nature and wildlife bit um, while you're teaching them the all the skills that, and knowledge that you have. Is that right? Yeah, so look, I've, I've been very fortunate. I've traveled the whole of Southern Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia. Namibia, I absolutely love. That is one of the most untouched places you can uh, visit for diversity in photography. And then obviously, obviously South Africa, um, very much sort of cut my teeth on there. So um, I also do a lot of uh, custom-made um, workshops or trips. Or uh, you know, I don't like using those sort of terms or a journey or an experience, but you know, off the beaten track where you can physically go and walk. Uh, you can, uh, we, I work with a, a group of field guides who are qualified uh, in walking. I have some uh, properties in wilderness areas where it's not roughing it, but it's not five-star camping. Uh, yep. You know, it's a nice big structure, tent, bathroom, comfortable beds, good food, and you can walk all day. You go out at night and, and it's, it's, it's a very unique experience. So that sort of that for me has become my focus. But then Amazing. I still do migration, Zimbabwe, Namibia, all of that. But from a personal point of view, sort of that's my mission as to where I want to go and what I want to share with people. So it's not really the mainstream. It's not favorite on social media, put it this way. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. That sounds great. We'll make sure that uh, everybody has some links. Uh, if you want to uh, actually put your Instagram on the chat, if you can, Andrew, just to make sure that people have your handle, that'd be great. And then, um, then I'm going to ask you, um, did you have any particular photos that you wanted to share with us today that uh, that you had? Um, yeah, I've, I just want to see if I can top you. Um... And I'll make sure that it's pinned. I can even pull it up um, if that's good for you. Yeah, at, at Andrew Averly. Um, But um, you'd have to go to my bio. There's a, I think it's called Linktree. Um, most of my contact details are there. Um, most of my good. Instagram feed is very different. It's still yeah. more of a personal, non-commercial type of enterprise for me. Um, yeah. you know, but again, I should be into social media a lot more. But yeah, <laughs> um, I, would, 
I did. I did have a question. I, <laughs> I, I wanted to to ask a little bit about this particular image when I was looking at your uh, your work. This one caught my eye big time. So, um, let me just see. Can you guys see my screen? Am I sharing now? Nope, not yet. All right, not yet. Give me one sec here. This image. Um, one sec. There we go. All right. So you guys see that shot? So this shot, Andrew. Um, you know, blew me away. This is this is incredible shot. How on how in the world did you capture this? And do you have a story behind this? Yeah, look, um, this is actually quite a few years old, and um, sort of it was more um, of a shot that happened. It wasn't planned. Um, this is in the Chobe River in Botswana. I think it was in twenty sixteen or seventeen. I can't remember. Um, but basically there you can get very close up to elephants and, um, you know, a lot of the guides that I use or work with operators there sort of don't crowd the animal. They'll stay further away and watch natural behavior. Yep. Unfortunately, with this shot, we were parked maybe 50 or 60 yards away from the elephant. Uh, it mm -hmm. was more to, to the right hand side and um, two other vessels parked us in. So we had nowhere to go, and the elephant decided it was time for him to come towards us. And he just, as if he weren't there, and he was feeding. This photo is not an aggressive. This was an elephant taking grass, smashing the mud off the grass and just eating. And he stood there for maybe yeah. 10 minutes. And that was yeah. at 16 millimeters. I only got three <laughs> shots, but then it was mud, and I was covered in everything. Yeah. So it was one of those I moments where... I don't like to be on top of animals, but you know, at some point you've just got to sit and wait and, and we couldn't move. So, you know, it all yeah. worked out very well. And um, yeah, so it was an incredible experience. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, there's something right away where I'm like, you know, how the heck did this guy create, I was figuring camera trap or something, but I, you could tell based on the, you know, a little bit of the distortion, this was a wide angle shot. So uh, beautiful work. And I absolutely love that one. So, you know, thanks for satisfying my curiosity on how that was, <laughs> How that happened um now do you have any images in particular that you would like to share some stories um based on some encounters yeah it's it, it's a bit difficult with with over one hundred and seventy thousand images in your library <laughs> <laughs> um but I, I like to look at more current stuff um you know each time i go uh, i've got a very different way of working i'll be in the bush for a week or if i go on a day trip I don't download the photos immediately. Um, I, well, I do. I put them on a hard drive, and then I let them sit and stew for a week or two. Then I'll take them out and have a look at them because then the unnecessary, unnecessarily romantic attachment is gone, and then the <laughs> one with a stew blade of grass or the this, then I can you know genuinely get rid of them. And then yeah. I will work with those. Um, I'll choose a few which I really like, and then um, I program it into my social media. And then, um, yeah, I'll take about three months before I really sit down, unless it's an image that just knocks me off of my feet, then, you know, it's done. Um, but I always like to sit and digest. Um, and then uh, I wrote in a blog the other day, I've got a WTF folder, what the fluff folder. <laughs> an image speaks to me and I actually, I, I, I don't understand why. I'm just drawn to the image. And yeah. then some random happening or something I read, and then I'll I'll go back. And then I understand why I took the photo and I connect with it. So, you know, it, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, a lot of my stuff is very different. I do have one. Um, I must just see. Let me just open it. Yeah, you can't see my screen yet. Uh. I'll let you know when we can see it. Yeah. And and also if if you have uh, the ability to maybe give a preview of what you're donating for Prince for Wildlife uh, for our campaign coming up, that would be great too. If, oh, if it's I handy. Didn't no I didn't put that online just yet. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Quick. And if you guys have any questions at all, when we're talking to Andrew uh, and you want to get some of his uh, brilliant insights, please ask the questions uh, just in the side there. And then we're able to kind of monitor those questions and get, him, get Andrew uh, on the spot here to answer any. So Nick, Nick said uh, he highly recommends your photography course. Uh, and absolutely incredible knowledge. So it looks like you have a raving fan there. <laughs> oh, no, I suppose I'm going to have to buy him a coffee for that comment. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can do this uh, share. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, it should be on the website. Allow my yeah. browser to have access or something like this. This is a new um, thing for me. References. Yeah, I'm surprised we got over the the technical woes there. That was um, it's hard to, <laughs> to to say what to do when we're looking at different screens. But I'm happy that you joined and it all worked out. So again, guys, if you if you didn't hear me, uh, please add, ask any questions that you have for Andrew as a contributing photographer for Prince for Wildlife. Uh, if there's anything that you want to know uh, or learn, just please type that in there, and we'll get to your your uh, questions. I'm going to pull up a couple other shots here. Okay, can you see my screen? There it is. Yeah. Okay, so this is an, an actually an unpublished photo. Um, I've not uh, shown it to oh, anybody yet. Uh, this is actually a photo which I, I managed to create um, a few months ago, um, and uh, it was actually on a sunrise. Um, uh, shoot with a with a great group of people from um, from America who came to experience Africa in a very different way. Um, they yep. came with a, a a lady from America who does um, a lot of visual and a lot of um, hearing type of of exercises. And we were sitting in the in the pitch black waiting for the sun to rise. Um, yeah, sorry, more... Andrew. Just Andrew, can we um, we just have a um, someone said? Can you make that picture bigger? We're just seeing the thumbnail there. I'm not sure if that's uh, if you have the full image. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, hold on a sec. Yep. Can you see it now? Uh, still, still just the thumbnail. Okay, I'm let me sure just go it... to sharing, and I'm sure I've just got to change the sharing. Yep, no problem. Thanks for the uh, field feedback there. Uh, I think it's silk, silk a. And, and then we there have a we question. Go. Let's see. And, there and there. beautiful. Yeah, we're good. So um, I've actually started sort of wondering how I can share sort of what I thought and and and, and what I experienced at the time with my photos. And um, I've, I'm recording a few. I, I, I'm not great at podcasts, but just recording sort of thoughts and memos and putting them to a photo. So it's not a, a live podcast. So I'm using a lot of different images and things to to create these. So this is, this is actually one of the first ones I've done. So it's not a spoiler alert, but then you know maybe people can see and understand a little bit more about my thinking. So you can imagine being on top of maybe 200 foot up on a granite boulder, and yep. you're sitting pitch black, dead silence. You can hear the hornbills, the Franklins. You can hear nothing else, and you're breathing. And then as the sun came up, everybody was like, oh, amazing. And then it went quiet. And if any of you have watched any war movies, you would um, know what the sound of a Huey helicopter sounds like. And when its blades are, are cracking in the uh, atmosphere, it's a very low thud sound. And um, you might not see it, but there's a black speck here on the photo. And that's a Huey helicopter. So basically, I heard that about three minutes before it flew past. So, you know, there was a whole lot of emotion, and I didn't want to try and zoom in on the helicopter, try to, you know, create the understanding when I tell the story about the sounds of the UE helicopter uh, that they used to hear, and it's an iconic sound in aviation. And this was actually an anti-poaching mission that had gone out just after sunrise, uh, sadly Amazing. heading into the Kruger National Park. Um, yeah. So... You know, to me, it's just more about not just the sunrise, but the story behind that. And, and I don't think people would have understood that from just seeing a little speck, which maybe you can see is a helicopter. Yeah, I mean, that that context is is so important, right? I, I think that that's, uh, that's incredible, by the way. Uh, gorgeous shot and the colors and, and everything just it's it's unreal. But I can imagine that the sound of the helicopter just echoing throughout uh, throughout the, you know, the landscape there beautiful yeah no, look it was pretty special and um you know there was a tear shed afterwards from some of the people that came there you know for them america you know a lot of them were sort of more mature people and they've got recollections of the ue and and wars and stuff like that so it had a double impact on them and you know for them to realize that they were in africa to see this beauty and be involved with other projects there 
um, you know, it was really special. Um, so that would be sort of, for me, the most recent one that has a, a very long story. Um, and it's not sharing. Oh, let me just find the other one. Um, no problem. And, and, in, and in, this, uh, you know, in this gap here, Elizabeth just asked, uh, what charitable organizations do you support or do you recommend um, with, you know, with your work? Do you have any ones in particular that come to mind that we can look at? Um, well, basically, I, I, I have three um, main organizations. The one would be Prince for Wildlife. Um, most of my stuff goes internationally to Hugh. I've also been involved in a um, in a um, another organization that does fundraising, um, and that would be uh, the Remembering Wildlife, the coffee table books. Yeah, um, I've been fortunate to share in in those. Unfortunately, I've never seen a polar bear, so I didn't make this year's um, <laughs> this year's book. Um, so yeah, it was. Um, those are sort of the main ones. And here yep. in South Africa on the ground, um, I use a very small organization called Pit Track. Um, they do a lot of anti-poaching with dogs. Um, they also work with horn. They work with um, pangolins. Um, and I think sort of um, more and more pangolins are becoming a, a much more um, sort of unheard of problem, but they are the most trafficked animal in Africa currently and have been uh, for a while. So yeah. that's sort of where I'm going with my work um, in the near future. Okay, let's just see if this opens. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen now again with you. I've opened this in a- We're gonna be professionals at this by the time, uh, time our meeting's done here. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so this is just uh which one is this can you see now yep beautiful can you see the leopard yes okay so um this is sort of one of my also my personal favorite types of photography where i um i don't use flash at all at night um, and i use uh, non-directive light. So I would work with a tracker or another guide on another vehicle to illuminate the leopards at night. And I'm, I'm sure everybody knows about the Sabi Sands. That's one of the places you can go where you pretty much uh, really, really uh, could enjoy this type of photography. But again, if you go on a general safari, you don't get the time and that sort of thing to, to stay with these animals. Sort of when we go, we will check choose one or two sightings and we'll spend most of the evening there. Uh, you know, so th that type right. of photography is where I first went on a proper real safari to the bush in 2005. And yep. the first animal I really saw, not this photo, but the first one I saw blew my socks right off me. And it was m m an incredible sort of experience uh, seeing that type of, um, you know, lighting and style of photography. So basically that, would come out of my camera uh, with very little editing done to it at all. So I use the camera, some of the yep. picture styles and very basic uh, editing yep. on a lot of my work, except my black and white. Amazing. Yeah. I love it. And, and just a question in terms of the settings, what, what type of settings are you uh, shooting that at for, you know, for the viewers here? Uh, do, I have do, a do you remember that? Way of I, I saw a hundred thousand. No. <laughs> said I saw hundred thousand. <laughs> I start very simple and you can, you know, have a look at most of my photos. I'll start with one one hundredth of a second. Um, if I can shoot at an aperture of F 2.8 or F4. Mm -hmm. If you can't shoot at F4, F5.6 is okay. And my starting ISO, if it's a 2.8 lens, is 3200 uh, or 6400. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not one to talk about noise. I think the obsession people have with noise is absolutely unhealthy. Um, it's a part of life. It's a part of photography. Unless you are a, a, somebody who's shooting the cover of Vogue or you're shooting some fine art person print, noise is a realistic thing. And, yeah, I, I can talk. It's a whole other webinar on its own, uh, what I think of noise. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's great. That's great feedback. I think a lot of people are scared, you know, when they get into wildlife photography, they think they need, you know, these lenses that shoot F8 or F2.8 and they, they need these big bazookas well, when in reality, 
you know, they, you can pull off a lot of these images with, um, you know, relatively mid-level lenses for sure. Well, this specific photo was taken at F8. Yeah. Oh, there you uh, go. I'm not going to name the brand of camera, but it was taken at F8 at yeah. one two hundredth of a one one hundredth of a second and ISO 6400. Yep. Yeah. And what, what so, camera body are you using for everybody? Well, this was a Canon R, R6 and a 100 to 400 F, the F5.6 to F8. The, I call it the fantastic plastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's an absolutely incredible lens, light to travel with. And, you know, one of my guests was using a, my 300 2.8 for this shot. Uh, so <laughs> I was just using what I had. And, you know, I still enjoy uh, the images I capture. Um, this is, um, you know, sort of one of my the nicer side profiles that I've got recently. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. You have uh, Adam in the in the comments there, uh, also um, expressing his you know his liking for the shot. So uh, beautiful. It's unreal. All right, the next one is a, a really special photo for me uh, for many reasons, um, but this is one of only three wild born wild roaming white lions in the world um now there's a lot of stories and a lot of misunderstandings in the world about white lions but these are the only three um, when i say genuine white lions it's a recessive gene from a tawny lion and there's a mm -hmm. different combination of genes between a male and a female that have to be in place for them to have this some people call it genetic mutation, but yep. I just call it a really special uh, animal. This is a male who's now six years old. He roams in the Kruger National Park, mm -hmm. and he roams sort of near a camp called Satara. It's very well known for its predators. It took me 18 months to finally get three photos of him that I've kept. So I spent in total 29 days searching for him um, because you don't off-road in the Kruger, there's only a certain amount of roads, but I missed him maybe 20 times. Um, wow. And then a few weeks ago, I got really lucky and found him on this burnt patch. Um, yep. And, um, yeah, um, he's, uh, there are another two lions. They're also bordering the Kruger straight west of here, about 37 kilometers. Uh, yep. And it's a brother and a sister, and they're about three years old. So, wow. you know, from a, from a point of view of nature, this is – this was my highlight so far uh, in photography. Amazing. And and just uh, for details here, Elizabeth asks, is this a, a leucistic lion? Is that no. the, the terminology? No. No, he is. It's a, a, I don't want to use the word leucistic, but it's a, it's a, it's a recessive gene. It's only specific to, to this type of lion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm still doing some studying on the actual genetics and that type of thing. Um, but leucistic is, is a way you can look at it, but um, he's not an albino because he doesn't have pink eyes and he doesn't have perfectly blue eyes either. Um, yeah. So when it comes to lion, there is a different uh, way they express it, but similar to other leucistic animals, yes. Amazing. Gorgeous shot. Thanks for the Thank question, you. Elizabeth. Yeah, you bet. Um, let me just find some. So I also like using light. So very simple um techniques using exposure um yeah. and this is another favorite this is a malachite kingfisher mm -hmm. um and i sat next to a small stream and basically about 60 seconds before i took this photo he was in full sunlight so mm -hmm. everything was evenly exposed all green and the sun went down behind started setting and there was yeah. obviously a gap in the foliage and it was like a spotlight landing on him so Beautiful. i basically i enjoy using underexposure especially with color and um, i generated this really really cool image um it's one of the yeah. nicest malachites i've photographed but um yeah it's uh, just all <laughs> about the lot yeah no I, I love the separation as well like beyond just separation of uh the subject in the background with you know using a, a wide aperture it's it's using actually shadows and highlights uh just yeah. beautifully so well done there it's amazing um yeah so i'll just find one or two. there's another one i had here now which i don't know where i've put it it's a it's a recent photo that um i'm very very 
very attached to. Uh, one second. Well, I'm, I'm looking at you scroll through those, and it looks like you have uh, an amazing collection there. There's probably a million oh, stories. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm just trying to find the photo. Um, yeah, it must be uh, somewhere. Yeah, um, this year I've got a, a personal project is to find some of the big elephants of the Kruger that still roam here. Nice. Um, yeah. There's only about 16 tuskers, but also a very, very unique, nice time of the day to photograph elephants with soft clouds. Uh, mm -hmm. Also the zebra in the background. Um, so, amazing. yeah, I love bird photography that's different. <laughs> Fixed wow. portraits. It's a saddleable stalk, a beautiful bird. Um, and he stood and stared at me for 10 minutes, and I didn't know what else to do but shoot him square on. So I've got that portrait. I've got it landscape. I've got it to the left of the – I mean, he just sat there. <laughs> with the vehicle. Perfect little model. That's a, that's a beautiful yeah. shot. I love that. Uh, I told you about the rhino dehorning. This yep. was the same project. Um, the business people actually collared two sets of wild dog, two packs. Um and this to me, this was a fish eye at 15 millimeters. Yep. So I was very fortunate to be up close. Um, but it shows you it's a game reserve. So there's a fence. The clouds are a pure, pure bonus, um, but also one of my favorite wild dog images. Um, you know, there you can see the collar. And yep. um, yeah, I, just to tell people about wild dog movement, we collared this um, animal. And the next morning, they were 44 kilometers away from where they were. 44, wow. Uh, they move huge amounts um, of, of kilometers, and they can at night or even during the day. It's amazing. And, and in order to get that uh, exposure on the dog, is that with a spotlight, or how is that achieved? Yeah, there was a small spotlight. Um, I, yep. tried, I try with flash, but I had no con drive flash. So it was just a little bit of illumination uh, with a flashlight, a, um, yep. a spotlight. Got it. And as I said earlier about underexposure, um, this image took a week to get and was pure luck. Um, this is in the uh, Kalahari or the Kalahari. Um, there was a place in, in the month of May, the first two weeks, where the sun sets between a dune. And it's lower than any other place. And there's fortunately a place where ostriches dust bath. And... Um, Got some really good photos of them bathing, but the sun was still very high. Yeah. And then one afternoon, I think it was the fifth or the sixth day, this guy came past as the sun set, underexposed. It was just perfect. Um, I have yeah, uh, on, in post processing, I have dropped the exposure by half a stop. Um, but other than that, it's basically as I shot it, uh, white balance on 5300 Kelvin. It's what I standard use. Um, I don't really use auto white balance too much because uh, mm -hmm. I love rich, rich expense, expensive colors. Yeah, gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. And you say, it, you know, it took you a week and it was all luck. I think that that's the preparation when it meets the opportunity. So I would say that, uh, you know, you, <laughs> there's no luck involved there. You, you had, <laughs> well, you had, you had from, a shot in mind. <laughs> yeah, look, this is from the same week. Um, yeah. But again, a, a different area, maybe 200 meters to the south of where I was, where there was grass, but yeah. that's the only time I could drive up and down with the light to get a shot. So, you know, at the end so of the different. day, if you've got a plan, stick to it and don't jump off a tomato box if you don't get sort of the shot that you want. Make use of the light and make sure you can um, sort of still enjoy yourself and don't yeah. set too many uh, uh, high goals. Just enjoy the light. I'm just trying to find... The yeah, I find that's often, often the case with uh, wildlife photography and, you know, specifically is people's expectations are usually so high because, you know, we're often seeing the portfolio shots of all these photographers from all over the world taking like the, you know, the cream of the crop, the best shots, when in reality, you know, that takes days and months, sometimes years to create, uh, create that work. So whenever you're going on any type of safari, it's like basically expect nothing, everything's a bonus, you will be a lot happier after that. Yeah, look, and I mean, I think that's why I've got such a huge anti-social media at the moment because <laughs> it's so far directed from reality. But, um, you know, there's there's so much more to enjoy, uh, I've found, just with nature. And I think that's why I'm trying to help people connect a little bit better. Um, I've now dumped this photo twice. I'm just going to close this window and reopen it. 
Yeah, no problem. Uh, Silke asks, uh, what's your personal uh, hidden gem in South Africa in terms of, uh, you know, small amount of tourists, not too fancy and expensive, but plain nature and great sightings. Any, any hot tips there that you would say? It is so, South Africa is so diverse. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to sort of quantify that. But if, if you had somebody that basically, um, if predators weren't highest on your list, um, you could go to nearly a lot of places. Um, uh, one place that comes to mind is Marakele. It's right up on the north of South Africa. And um, you can camp there. There's some very old chalets there. It's not sort of uh, luxury. You've got to accept the fact that it's maybe um, 40 years old, the infrastructure. Um, there's also a lot of places in South Africa, um, Central South Africa. We've got Mountain Zebra National Park. We've got, um, sure, we've got quite a few places. But the Kruger itself has also got quite a number of places you can go that is off the beaten track, but you can still enjoy and see a large number of animals. Um, but again, you need to look and need to have your expectations uh, sort of at a level where if you go for five days and you don't see a lion, you're not going to be upset about it. Um, you know, you don't always see all of these animals. If you want to see that, you can go to the south of the Kruger National Park, and that is much like a circus and a zoo uh, because you have up to 50 vehicles that are sighting there because it is a national park. Um, it's like South Africa, it's a tradition to go to the Kruger. Some people I know have been going there for 50 years every year for a month. They stay in one place. They just sort of live and breathe it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, uh, she's welcome to, to drop me a message. And if she's got any sort of specific questions or subjects that she's looking for, um, I can uh, very much help her in the right direction. Um, the same goes with Namibia. Um, that's also, you know, a lot of people don't know uh, much about Namibia except for sort of Itosha and a lot of the places where people find the desert elephants and the rhinos. Uh, but yeah. there's so much more to the country that you can see. Um, but, yeah, um, I think I found the photo I want to show you. Uh, I can't Great. think to find or oh, get it to open for some reason. Um, uh, sharing screen. So there we go. Can you see that? Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Gorgeous. So this is also one of my unpublished photos. It's a, um, a pelican um, taken in a, um, an area called the Makuleki, which is uh, right on the northern boundary of Zimbabwe. It's actually part of the Kruger National Park. But those that know South Africa's history in 1994, uh, when we became a democracy, there were some um, areas and tracts of lands that were um, re-given back to communities and tribes. And this whole yeah. Makuleki region was actually the first what we call a lands claim. And it was given back to the original inhabitants. And they returned into an agreement with Sand Parks to manage it for them. So there's only three places to stay there. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you won't find a lion um, or a leopard. You may see tracks of leopards, but your predators you're not going to see. But the diversity... Um, 80% of the Kruger National Park's biome and diversity is in the Makuleki. That's wow. over 400 bird species. Um, a lot of the stuff you do, this is one of the wilderness areas we go on foot. Um, yep. So this is a really, really, really special place. Um, you Absolutely know, for gorgeous. Experience. And that is a shot after dark. It was very cool. I managed to track the birds um, using the new uh, eye tracking on a lot of systems. And you can actually lock the focus. And if you go through a tree, it will still focus on the bird. But I focused and watched the bird come through the opening of the tree. I must have yeah. tried 10 times and then one stuck. But yeah. you know, I'd seen this earlier this year and was hoping to find something in that gap. And yeah, for me, it was really special. That's incredible. That's uh, yeah, gorgeous shot. I love the tones too. I mean, that... A little bit of that blue uh, mixed with the white. I mean, that that color contrast there is just gorgeous. 
And yeah, for, I find, I find yeah, a lot of people don't use white balance to their benefit because that can create so much, uh, you know, without going and spending six hours editing a photo, a few slips to the left or to the right, you can just, you know, it's a completely new, um, you know, picture that you can envisage or create. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm all about the minimalistic uh, editing and, and not over processing. I love that approach. Um, that's really great. It's uh, it's fantastic to, to see these these shots. I mean, these unpublished shots, Andrew, you know, I was already, like I said, on your social media, but you said that you're an anti-social media guy. So it's, it's nice to kind of get the, the, you know, we get to look inside your computer. And I think that, uh, you know, if, if more people uh, could see your work, they would obviously uh, be super excited to share it and, and I'll probably buy prints as well because uh, it's gorgeous. So I just want to commend you Thank on you. your work. It's beautiful. Well, most um, of my stuff, there, there is some some of my work on my website. That's the only place I've sort of really shared. Um, I have a very big passion for black and white and I published yeah. a book last year, just a very small number. And I've actually got the gallery. Black and white is sort of one of those things that sort of, my whole life have meant a lot to me. So yeah, they, my website is my name um, and guys can have a look there. There's a whole lot more about me. Um, the actual, not handwritten by, it's handwritten by myself and a friend, and it's actually more representative of who I am. So not really a commercial <laughs> profile. No, that's that's great though. I mean, I, it's, it's a way to differentiate yourself as well. I find that a lot of sites kind of look like wallpaper after, after a while. Um, but uh, any more questions, guys, for, for Andrew here while we have him? Um, otherwise, uh, please follow him on Instagram. Check him out. He's, he's one of the contributing photographers for Prince for Wildlife this year. And um, I'm excited to see, you know, P and Marion are behind the scenes picking and choosing which one of our photos as photographers that they're that they're putting forth this year. Um, and so it's uh, it's going to be a big announcement and exciting uh, campaign this this year. And uh, again, I'd like to thank everybody. Oh, Adam's uh, putting your link in there. That's perfect. So if you guys want to check out more stuff with Andrew, please follow him on social media. Check out all of his amazing work on his website. And uh, yeah, bug him. Send him send him a bunch of direct messages and, and pick his brain. Happy to do that. I'll be standing by with a cup of coffee just now. Perfect. That's great. Okay, guys. Well, thanks, thanks Andrew, again for your time today. Um, you know, we truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to figure out the audio, the technical issues, how to share our screen, but also just your your commitment to conservation and showcasing. You know, when we're doing these photographer spotlights, there's a million different ways that people can get involved in conservation. And uh, you've shared a few of a few of those ways today with us. And uh, obviously your passion for photography and helping people is really shining through. So um, thank you from from, you know, from myself and from Prince for Wildlife um, for being involved. No, well, thank you, guys. And thank you very much for those that attended. And yeah, I look forward to being a contributor in the future as well. Awesome. Okay. We'll stay in touch and thank you guys and stay tuned for our next uh, photographer spotlight in the coming days. All right. Bye for now. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.